Hello everyone. Today is Thursday, June the 20th, 2013, and w uh, welcome to my audio blog about technology. Uh, my name is Mark, and I'd like to talk to you today about microcomputers, uh, the early history of microcomputers. But before I do that, I'd just like to briefly mention uh, a couple of things. Uh, I'd like to mention the DEC PDP-8 mini computer, which uh, first appeared in 1965, a 12-bit computer. Uh, it cost $18,000. Uh, it was the first mass-produced mini computer. Now, uh, I was born in 1965, so I thought that would be an interesting starting point to talk about. Uh, in the early 1970s, when I was uh, very young, uh, I saw mini computers uh, from DEC and Honeywell. I saw them at uh, General Motors. There was a General Motors open house and uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to one of those events and um, so like I wasn't actually able to touch them or anything but I saw these uh, these devices the size of a large refrigerator and I thought wow wouldn't it be awesome to have uh, have a computer in my home uh, so anyways uh, let's move on to early 1975 and um, a company called uh, MITS uh, which stands for uh, micro instrumentation and telemetry systems made a prototype of a computer called the Altar. They called it the Altar 8800. Um, and later on that same year, a gentleman by the name of Dick Heiser, uh, in July 1975, in Los Angeles, California, opens the very first retail computer store for the public. Now, uh, I'll describe a little bit more about the Altar. Uh, it was it had an Intel 8080 CPU, and uh, it had a front panel with switches, and an S what they called an S100 bus. And the the earliest version of the Altair only had 256 bytes of memory, no keyboard, just the front panel with the switches, and uh, you know. So you had to toggle in your bootstrap loader before you could do anything with it, before you could even load uh, any programs. And uh, later on, uh, okay, so you, you can imagine this. You're sitting in front of your altar, and you're, it's not doing a lot. It's blinking red LEDs at you. That's the output. Later on, uh, one could obtain a paper tape reader slash punch, and at least you could load in the... Uh, the programs from paper tape so uh, you know people should be uh, pretty amazed about what we can do with computers now because when you look back at the very beginning of uh, hobbyist or home computers they really were primitive okay now I'm going to go to uh, a little bit farther forward and talk about Byte magazine which I think is a very significant uh, event. Byte Magazine is, launches their first issue in September of 1975, and uh, it's an amazing historical resource to look back on, uh, especially uh, the early issues. It's hard to imagine uh, a magazine doing this now, but in the early days of Byte Magazine, there was tons of schematics, and there was all sorts of tips on how to write your own interpreter, uh, like specifically write your own APL interpreter. That was prominent. There was almost every issue had schematics and uh, all sorts of source code listings, and uh, it was very uh, thick with information. In fact, you know, comparing it to a modern magazine, the amount of ac actual information you had back then was really uh, significant. Okay, now I'm going to go to December of the same year, 1975, and I'll just mention briefly that the Byte Shop, 
started to sell Apple Ones at that time. Okay, so we can see that a lot of things happened in 1975, merely 10 years after uh, the release of the uh, PDP-8. Okay, so it took us 10 years to get from the PDP-8 to uh, the first retail computer stores. Now, in 1976, a company called MOS releases something a uh, little uh, single board computer called the Kim 1 uh which had 1k of ram 1 kilobyte of ram it had the Kim stands for keyboard input monitor now i'll just describe uh it briefly uh it's a single board computer with a hexadecimal a 24 button keypad and the output is uh, six uh segmented LEDs uh, each LED would have seven segments just like a lot of calculators have now and uh, you could get a paper tape reader slash punch for it uh, and you didn't need to type in you didn't need to toggle in the bootstrap loader there was a ROM uh, that contained the terminal interface monitor or the TIM uh, on a chip so you didn't have to uh, at least you didn't. It was one advance over the Altar. You didn't have to uh, uh, toggle in that bootstrap loader. Um, two serial ports and uh, Byte Magazine announces uh, an article about the Kim computer uh, in the April 1976 issue. So um, you know you could probably find a PDF file of that issue and read about it in much greater detail than I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, so from 1976 we can see we had Altars and we had, there were a few other ones, and we had the Kim 1, we had these single board computers, we had kits that uh, an electronic savvy person could make a fairly decent computer for not too much money. Um, okay, so briefly in 1977, what we call the Trinity appears. Apple II, TRS-80 Model 1, and the Commodore PET. Now we see a prototype of the Commodore PET debut in January of 1977. Okay. Um, in September 1977, we started to see com computer land ads appear in Byte magazine. So computer lands appeared all over the place uh, in most major cities, like in Toronto, Los Angeles, all over the United States, in Canada. And um, that was a place where you could go in and you could buy a Commodore PET, for example. Um, and I'm sure there were other computers that they had. I just can't remember, if I think about it a little more, I could probably remember a few other ones. Um, in December 1977, we started to see a big development, which was the TRS-80 Model 1 started to appear in Radio Shack. Now, in 78 and 79, a lot of young people uh, were looking at these uh, TRS-80 Model 1s and they would have them displayed in the front window of the Radio Shack so everybody walking past you know you're in the mall and you're walking past Radio Shack around that around 78, 79 we started to see these um, these computers appear in shopping malls so it became very ubiquitous and Anybody, you know, with five hundred dollars, with about five hundred dollars, you could go out and you could actually buy a computer in the home. Uh, no soldering, no kit. Yeah, it was it was a ready-made computer, and I'll just just uh, describe it a little bit. Um, Z80 microprocessor that ran at 1.77 megahertz. Uh, they sold about two hundred thousand of these Model Ones. Uh, your monitor was a uh, RCA, black and white RCA TV, and um, you could get 4 kilobytes to 48 kilobytes of RAM, depending on the uh, configuration. 
Uh, now, I'm just briefly, if you compare that to stuff like the Kim One and the Altar 8800, uh, the most striking thing is the fact that you didn't really have any form of monitor, like video monitor, on these older computers. So it's hard to it's hard for us to imagine nowadays no monitor at all. But that's what if you go back far enough, that's what computers were like. They didn't have uh, any video display at all. They would just have th they would just have certain outputs like a uh, uh, a teletype type device, and you would uh, you would type in your um, whatever a line of uh, basic say you're doing basic programming, and everything would appear on paper. There would be no screen as such. Um, and so you know it was a lot it was a lot more cumbersome if you ran out of paper I mean what would you do right you'd be stuck so anyways uh, around August of 2000 of, of uh, 1979 I started thinking well I'm gonna save up my uh, my you know my paper route money and get a TRS-80 model 1 um, that was when I first started to get a little bit more serious about it. Think that well, there's absolutely no reason why this wouldn't work, and it was fascinating because you go before that, and these these earlier kits would have been really difficult for a young person like me at the time. They would have had a lot of trouble working with you know without any real electronics experience. Uh, it would be very difficult for the average person to use a computer from uh, 1975 to the uh, 1977. It would be really hard. Uh, okay, so in 1979 we started to see the TRS-80 Model 2s and they were really expensive. I should point out that they were about $3,500 and they had 8 inch floppy drives and they used uh, an operating system called TRS-DOS. So, um, and then by January 1981, the TRS-80 Model 1s are discontinued. So there's still people, of course, collectors of vintage hardware that have TRS-80 Model 1s, but they were really, honestly, they really weren't that good. They There was lots of problems with them, and it's hard for me to uh, look back on a Model 1 with fondness. Uh, but, as I said, that was, uh, in a lot of cases, it was the TRS-80 Model 1 or nothing. Um, okay, they, there were Apple IIs and there were the Commodore Pets, so th those were the other two choices, of course. And I, I have to say that, you know, I was a Commodore person even back then, so, you know, if I was to get one of those three machines, I'd probably want a, a Commodore PET. That's the one... I just just like the Commodore computers better. Uh, okay, and a lot, uh, to continue on that point, 1981, the VIC-20 appears, and I got mine fairly early, Christmas of 1982. Definitely remember that. It had 5K of RAM, 3,583 bytes for basic and I still have a working VIC-20 actually so it uh, it's stood the test of time over 30 years um, and that same year 1981 uh, this Commodore Super Pet which was designed in Canada appeared in schools and uh, our, our high school got one and also in 1981 we saw the IBM 5150 very significant. Uh, had uh, set the industry standard after that, and they uh, had 256k of RAM and five ISA slots, so it was expandable. I should also mention that the Apple II had expansion slots, which the uh, uh, the Commodore Pet didn't have that, unfortunately. Um, August 1982, we see the Commodore 64 first appear, the best-selling computer of all time, and um, also in 1982 we saw something else very significant, the Columbia Data Products 
MPC 1600, the very first clone of the IBM PC. Uh, so we all know what happened after that. There were a whole flood of uh, IBM compatible computers, and almost everybody I know around that time, you know, say in the mid 80s or maybe a little later, they got uh, some form of uh, IBM clone. Uh, okay, 1985, the release of the Amiga 1000. Uh, it was just called the Amiga when it first appeared. Uh, they added the 1000 part later after the, uh, the, fi the Amiga 500 and the 2000 were released. And um, in 1987, I got my first Amiga, the Commodore Amiga 500, which had 512K of memory expandable to 9 megabytes. Uh, 7.16 megahertz, 68,000 CPU uh, that could do 640 by 200 resolution, uh, a 95 key keyboard, um, and a 3.5 inch micro drive or floppy drive. It, the proper name is micro drive. No one call almost nobody uses the proper name. Everybody calls them floppy drives. Even though the three and a half inch discs weren't a floppy, they were uh, rigid. So um, I still have the Amiga 500. Uh, I have a fi 52 uh, megabyte hard drive uh, with and it has a five meg of RAM expansion. Uh, well, four megs of RAM expansion and uh, plus the one meg on the on the board, uh, and it still works. Um, and I should also mention that the Minix operating system version 1.5 works with the Amiga 500. So if you wanted to go to the trouble of uh, putting on an open source operating system, you can do it with Minix 1.5. Okay, and I'm going to end the early microcomputer era with uh, the demise of Commodore. Uh, I just I'm I'm fixating on Commodore computers a lot, but that's that's what I use the most, and so Commodore goes bust in 1994, and in a lot of ways that um, that ended the early microcomputer era for me. Uh, or the hobbyist computer era. After that, we had uh, a much more heterogeneous uh, landscape in the microcomputer world. And then, you know, people don't even use the term microcomputer anymore. So I'm going to end it on that note. And I hope you found uh, this uh, episode informative. And thanks for listening.